everybody. Uh, welcome to the third episode of Not Being Governed on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Every Sunday from 3 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I'm the host, Daniel Hawkins. Uh, the videos can also be found at uh, notbeinggoverned.com where there's the Art of Not Being Governed blog with a lot of really great uh, writing that is put out um, every couple days pretty much. Um, so uh, the last couple episodes I talked about um, the European uh, nationalist and neo-Nazi movements uh, gaining a lot of popularity recently and how that's a pretty disturbing trend um, with a lot of support, more support than uh, it might seem, and how basically statism has opened the doors for them, and uh, how uh, statism also nurtures uh, these sort of artificial divides between races and um, at least facilitates animosity between them as they compete for political power. So today, um, it's actually in the same vein as that in a way. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, the current situation in Iraq and uh, Syria um, and the history of that uh and not only how it relates to the U.S.'s mistakes with foreign policy and uh, the West's mistakes with foreign policy, but also just um, generally statecraft and war and how that all um, plays into it and how the situation is pretty much uh, created by that. And without states, this whole situation probably would have never happened um, so, um, and it also, and it has a lot to do with, uh, ethnic and religious, uh, war and, um, friction in the region. Uh, so first I think it's important that everybody knows, um, something that's not really, uh, talked a lot about among Americans, especially uh, more right-leaning Americans is that Islam is not a uh, unified religion. Um, in in some senses, it is. But going back to the death of Muhammad in the seventh century, uh, there was a split. There was a schism between two branches of Islam. Uh, Shia Islam and Sunni Islam and it was over who would be Muhammad's successor as both the caliph um, which is a ruler uh, some would say that it'd be a religious warlord of sorts I guess um, or a king in a way um, and basically who his legitimate successor was and that determined uh, their doctrines and the differences in their doctrines were carried on throughout the two different successors. Um, one of them became basically the Shiite movement and the other became the Sunni movement. Um, and since then there's been conflict between the Sunnis and the Shiites. Part of that issue is that Muslims of different ethnicities, excuse me, have latched on to these, uh, have latched on to these two different sects. So you have the friction between denominations of Islam, and there are a lot more than those two, but those two are the biggest. Uh, but you also have ethnic battles that go back even further than the beginning of Islam, back into um, the time when there were more Christians and Jews and other uh, non-Muslim groups in the Middle East and in Northern Africa um, and in Eurasia. So lots of conflict that has been carried 
over through time. Um, as it stands right now, uh, the percentage of people who are uh, Shiites in the Middle East is fairly low, um, probably at the most, like 20%. Um, I guess the whole percentage of the Muslim population, I should say, is probably like 20%. Shia, maybe even less. Um, it's been estimated by some people uh, because the only officially Shia country in the Middle East is Iran, um, who are pretty powerful, but they are, and they, and there's a huge Shia population in Iraq as well, in eastern Iraq, and Iran and Iraq share their borders, so the east side of Iraq comes up against the west side of Iran and a lot of Shias have been living there for a very long time. Um, the rest of the Middle East is almost, and the rest of the Muslim world is pretty much entirely Sunni. Um, the whole Arabian Peninsula, pretty much, uh, Saudi Arabia, Oman, Qatar, um, the UAE, uh, Yemen is a little bit more mixed. Uh, and then obviously you have Syria, which is tons and tons and tons of Sunnis. Uh, Palestine has more Shias, um, or I guess the area known as Palestine has more Shias. Uh, and the Sunni culture and religion goes a lot further than that into North Africa and Asia and stuff. So there really aren't that many Shias when it comes down to it, even though Iran is like 95% Shia. Um, but in the north of Iraq, um, you have, and going into the north of Syria, into parts of Lebanon, and into southern Turkey, there are people called Kurds. And the Kurds are their own ethnicity who follow a kind of different type of Islam. Um, and some Kurds are even Christian, and some Kurds are, you know, they have a kind of different culture. Um, they've never had autonomy as far as I know, um, they are pretty much hated by a lot of different groups. Um, they've been marginalized over history. Uh, they've essentially been a minority group, but there are a lot of them in northern Iraq. Um, so some people say that in this situation, which in Iraq is essentially a battle between Shias and Sunnis, um, that the Kurds might be the only people left if they are spared by whoever uh, wins the battle. Um, but the two sides might eventually just kill each other, and then uh, the Kurds might be the only people left. Um, which may not be an entirely bad thing. Um, so, uh, basically, um, years ago, a few years ago, uh, the U.S. was drawing down in Iraq, I guess. Um, and they helped back a, who's the prime minister now, uh, and they helped back this thing called the Dawah Party. And the Dawah Party is a Shia party in Iraq. And keep in mind that the Iraqi Shia population is actually maybe probably like half of the Iraqi population, mostly centered in the east. So you're going to have a lot of dissatisfaction with Dawah's becoming the leaders of Iraq. Before him were, was a, probably, I think probably someone else, but the most notable leader before him was uh, Saddam Hussein. And Saddam Hussein was a Sunni, uh, mostly um, secular dictator, as we all know, uh, who was deposed by the United States. Um, who we actually put in power with the CIA in the 60s and supported during the Iran-Iraq war, even though we also supported Iran, as we all know, from the Iran-Contra scandal. So we funded essentially both, well, I, I say we loosely, I mean, obviously you have to take that with the rhetorical scalpel and separate the we, meaning you and I, uh, I'm referring to the United States government, not even just its people, just the government. So don't, you know, mistake that as responsibility being shifted to the populace. But they backed the, they backed 
Iran and Iraq, after pretty much screwing up Iran miserably uh, during the 60s um, with the rule of the Shah. And um, so this is going into the 80s and 90s. They supported both Iran and Iraq. Uh, there's actually a really good video by uh, Storm Clouds Gathering. You can uh, check it out. You might have already seen it um, about Iraq uh, and what they aren't telling you. Uh, definitely recommend the video. I can't say I recommend Storm Clouds Gathering in general, but I do recommend the video. Go watch it. Uh, you'll learn a whole lot and follow the links that he gives you and follow the links that I'll be giving you in the description because um, I don't want this to be hearsay. Um, but so the U.S. has had this history of kind of duplicity uh, in the Middle East, funding both sides, kind of hedging the bets, hoping that the other side doesn't find out that we've been funding their enemies. And this is essentially what's happening again right now. This is kind of like part three of the uh, Iraqi conflict, um, where, as you all know, we almost invaded Syria uh, and trying to depose Bashar al-Assad, who the Western and other international community has pretty much... Uh, labeled as an illegitimate ruler who has been violently oppressing and repressing his people. Uh, there have been reports of him using sarin gas on his population, but that is a little bit uh, suspect whether or not it was actually the Syrian military doing that, or it was the opposition who have been linked in large part to Al-Qaeda. So the U.S., has all but been proven to be funding uh, with non-lethal and lethal aid and perhaps training, according to WND, um, in Jordan, the Syrian opposition who have been linked to Al-Qaeda. And the ISIS, which is all over the news, is the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, also called the Islamic State of Iraq in the Levant, or ISIL. Um, they're a splinter group of Al-Qaeda. Um, the leader had a dispute with Al-Qaeda leadership. Um, pretty, it's a fairly decentralized group. Um, but then you also have all these other groups that have been participating that have links to Al-Qaeda or at least friendships with Al-Qaeda. Rebels coming from Libya, very hardcore, hardcore Sunni rebels coming from Libya that we helped fund. And obviously we saw the blowback of that. Um, that have been transferring arms, or those reports have been transferring arms to Syria from Libya that the U.S. gave them. Uh, um, basically, I mean, there are dubious ties that people talk about to the Muslim Brotherhood. That's not entirely settled yet. But there is al-Nusra, um, al-Qaeda, and the ISIS, and other uh, smaller groups. Um that have been attempting to overthrow Bashar al-Assad, uh, who is a Shia dictator um, with very, very strong ties, even though he's an Alawite, or not a Shia dictator, he's an Alawite dictator, sorry. Um, but he's very strong ties to Shia leadership in Iran. Um, and he has pretty much Iran's blessing, and he has had it for a while. Uh, he was backed by the USSR for quite a while, uh, his father was at least. Um, so, uh, recently there's been, and I'll put the link in the description, um, a video uh, you can probably find on YouTube. Uh, the Turkish government has banned YouTube. I don't know if it's back up yet or what, um, but they banned YouTube after an audio leak. Apparently, uh, this is a conversation among uh, Erdogan's... Uh, leadership, military leadership, talking about essentially planning false flags or some kind of covert military operations in Syria. Um, and Turkey are also pretty much Sunni, or at least Sunni sympathizers, um, planning on destabilizing Assad's regime and supporting al-Qaeda and the ISIS. So the ISIS have welcomed that support from Turkey, uh, but they are mostly funded out of, as far as we know, uh, Qatar, 
um, in Saudi Arabia, which corroborates the story that was put out uh, last year, I think, um, I think it was last year, about um, the military contractor Britam, which is a British-American military contractor that supposedly had some emails leaked uh, saying that they would be trafficking sarin gas, um, making it look like it was Russia, hiring people who spoke Russian and Arabic to transfer the sarin gas into Syria and conduct a false flag uh, on part of the Syrian government, on part of Bashar al-Assad. So essentially sparking a, a reason to invade. Um, Syria does not have oil. They do not really produce oil. Uh, they produce a lot of cashew seeds, I'm pretty sure. But they are a very strategic player, uh, being awfully very close to Israel um, and also Turkey and Iraq. Um, and if the United States were to install a puppet dictatorship in Syria, which it looks like it might be able to do, they would have essentially, the United States and its allies would essentially have complete control over uh, the Red Sea. Um, so that's pretty much a bad situation. I'm even thinking of Persian Gulf. No, I'm thinking of the Red Sea. Okay. Anyway, um, and some people are saying that maybe this is in a step to help uh, Israel because obviously a lot of people out there say that we are essentially um, puppets of the Israeli uh, leadership. I don't buy that entirely. I would say that we do have a too cozy a relationship and that we do help carry out a lot of their dirty work. Um, but that it's a stepping stone to toppling Iran, uh, which they would definitely like to do, seeing as Iran produces quite a bit of oil itself. Um, and that having two people on our side in Iraq and Iran, like we did for a little while there, would be a good thing for us, uh, economically and stuff. But so, the big point that I wanted to make is that the U.S. did install and back, this is public record, you can find it on like Huffington Post and, you know, Washington Post and stuff like that, that the U.S. did back the Dawa Party with, um, Nouri al-Maliki as the Prime Minister and that the US did approve of the Dawa party taking and other uh, Shias taking control of the Iraqi parliament. So we've essentially created this situation where we've divided the country in half and uh, this goes back to like the early 1900s when we pretty much created the, the nation of Iraq out of nothing same thing happened in a lot of Africa and Asia where we completely destroyed ethnic territory um, and border ethnic borders and set up our own state borders that have essentially forced people who don't like each other to live together. Some people might think that's a good idea, but that's resulted in years and years and years and years of violence. So now you have a transfer from Saddam's regime to this hardcore Shia re regime um, under al-Maliki, and even a lot of Iranian Shias have backed off of their support of him because he's a little bit crazy, um, and his military is pretty repressive, but a lot of eastern Iraq, very supportive of uh, Iran, or at least the Ayatollah, um, so, and Syria is very supportive of the Sunnis and the ISIS, uh, well, not the Syrian government, but the Sunnis in Syria, so... Basically, you have these two sides coming together and clashing in the middle of Iraq. And right now we can see that, and the Kurds are caught up in the middle, and a lot of other people are too. Essentially creating a massive war that has the potential to rip the Middle East apart and kill millions of people. Um, not that it hasn't already, but there was a war called well, the group of wars called the Wars of Religion throughout uh, mostly the 1600s and late 1500s in Europe between Protestants and Catholics that until World War One and World War Two, was the most catastrophic human tragedy that we've ever seen 
and that's essentially what's happening in the Middle East right now, and we're stoking the flames by funding ISIS, which it's pretty much been proven, all but proven, that we helped create, the United States helped create ISIS on one side and helped install al-Maliki on the other side. And now we're basically working with the Iranians, providing them both, providing both sides, F-16s and howitzers and tanks and uh, MRAPs and, you know, uh, APCs and stingers and, you know, javelins and anything you can possibly think of. We are helping them destroy each other to the benefit of us getting a lot of oil money and territory. Um, and this will not end up nicely for the United States Someone is going to win in the end, but if they do, they will know that the U.S. funded both sides. Um, but the, basically the point of the video that I wanted to make is, this has all been said by Storm Clouds Gathering, it's been said by plenty of pundits, it's been said by Antiwar.com, who I definitely recommend. Um, it's been said by plenty of people already that we know pretty much that we have created the monsters on both sides that are now tearing each other up. But basically the root of all of these problems isn't necessarily religion, um, but it's the state inserting itself. You know, they're a, it's a battle between theocracies, and you cannot have a theocracy without some manner of government. Otherwise, you can you just have theologians. Theologians become theocrats when they, you know, there's the crat part, which is indicative of government, a a leader, a government leader, and it's true that they can still inflict violence on other people by forming these uh, military, by forming these paramilitary groups, um, you know, guerrilla warfare groups. It's true that they can still do that, but by the same token, they cannot gain control of an entire country, rule over millions of people with a uniformed fighting force and police that have inflicted so much oppression, just like in Turkey recently, in Bashar al-Assad in Syria, and like the ISIS is doing. They can't do that without the help of a uniformed fighting force or at least without the help of government authority and passing laws. So, um, and this whole thing has been just built on the back of statism in the Middle East. A lot of that has been European and American influences during the age of imperialism. When we thought it was a good idea to draw lines on the maps there instead of letting the people figure out where they do and don't want to live. And and obviously there have been kingdoms in the Middle East before that, and there was the Ottoman Empire and the Seljuk Turks and stuff like that. But the West has pretty much created a lot of these countries out of nothing. And that's caused so much hatred. And you give someone... It's one thing to give someone a leg up in a guerrilla decentralized war, but it's another thing entirely to give people a systematic way of oppressing people, especially when you give them democracy. And there's been a lot of uh, pretty um, big uh, foreign policy experts that I've been talking about recently. Well, maybe democracy isn't right for everyone. But it's, and, and their fear is that, you know, one minority group won't get control and the other minority group, or the majority group, or whatever. Whoever wins will oppress the other side and it'll just go back and forth. But I don't think they quite understand that that's just how all governments work. Uh, but that's basically what's been happening, is that we've been giving them seats of power, which have not previously really existed. We've been giving them seats of power and then dictating to them who is the right guy to go after and who is the wrong guy to go after while at the same time stuffing our pockets with 
the money that comes out of their natural resources that we've essentially been appropriating over time. Uh, and, you know, people, you probably heard when Donald Trump in 2012 or 2011, when Donald Trump was talking about, oh, well, the Iraqis owe us that oil because we totally helped them, blah, blah, blah. No, they don't. Uh, and it wasn't like Iraq, 100% of the Iraqi population wrote in in a unanimous ballot and said, oh, we really like the U.S. to come in here and invade and occupy us and uh, kill a bunch of our people uh, or maybe start us a few drone uh, or, you know, kill people with helicopters and drones and that'd be really nice um, if they could just come here and fuck up our whole country. Uh, so that's not what happened. 100% of the Iraqi population did not unanimously approve of it, and that's what happens with democracy and all forms of government, is that there will always be a minority group who ends up losing, and they'll be angry about losing, and then when they gain control, they'll want vengeance on the other side. And when a minority group especially can get the military of a country on its side against the majority of people who don't want it, they now have more power than they ever could have, and we're nursing that right now. Um, so, yeah. Basically, the point is, statism kills all the time. That's what it does. It inflicts violence on people under the color of law. It creates chaos and disruption and hatred between people that normally would probably be using economics and mutual beneficial trade or maybe just, you know, social ostracism in order to shape the society that they want. But instead, you have presidents and prime ministers and caliphs and kings, emperors, that essentially force everyone to bend to their will. And it's not until we can communicate to Middle Easterners, to Muslims, everyone around the world, that they do not need that, that they can have self-determination, which what a lot of people think that's what religion should be about. Even organized religion should be about self-determination not some guy telling you what to do at the barrel of a gun um, that destroys the concept of faith completely, then it's just obedience to a person. Um, so yeah, uh, well, I hope you guys found this video useful and informative. Uh, if you want to correct me, go ahead and do that. Um, and I'll provide links in the description below. Uh, thanks for watching this video. Go check out the other videos on VVN and all around Turncoat Resource and uh, Art of Not Being Governed and all that. So um, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next week.